and welcome back to the And God Said podcast. I'm your host, Reverend Kimberly Constant, and it's been a minute. If you've been following along in real time, I had to pause for a little while to get all my lectures together because we are transitioning from our time in the Gospels to the letters of the Apostle Paul. And if you've been with me before in my covered cover Bible study that I teach, we went at a much more rapid pace where we did all of Paul's letters in one week, which I still can't believe we did that. So I had to create a lot of new material for that Bible study, which you probably also already know is offered in conjunction with this podcast. So if you want more information about the study, you can find that on my website, KimberlyConstantMinistries.com. There's a sign-up sheet there. It's never too late. I know we're into the letters of Paul, but really, it's never too late to sign up. I send out a weekly newsletter that has a reading plan and just some supplemental material for you to dive deeper and also opportunities to join in our Zoom discussion groups. Or you're just welcome to be here and following along with the podcast. So happy to have you, whatever brings you here, and really, really excited about this series on Paul. Uh, So today we're going to start off with an episode on the Apostle Paul himself. I've titled it Man, Myth, Legend. So let's dive in. So uh, our main sources for knowledge about Paul are the book of Acts, which of course, if you've been following along, we just finished and his own letters. Now, the book of Acts doesn't actually reference Paul's letter writing or use any of those contents. Despite the fact, and this is so interesting, that those letters, most of which would have been in existence by the time Acts was written. And I don't know why, but when I first started looking at the Bible, I just didn't realize this, because Acts comes before the letters. And so for some reason, I just didn't put two and two together, that the letters actually existed, a lot of them, before even the Gospels were written. Uh, And so we'll look at that as we look at each letter in particular. So he was born as Saul, uh, but he, he grew up in Tarsus. So he was both Jewish and Roman. Paul is his Roman name. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Um, And as a citizen of Rome, this affords him a lot of mobility within his missionary movements. So most likely, just from the fact that he grew up in Tarsus, we can say that his family probably had some wealth. Because to live there, you had to pay a tax. So there was a payment requirement to live in that city. His family were tent makers and probably also leather workers. And his Roman citizenship most likely came to him because of a father or grandfather who had offered military service to General Pompey or Antony. So his rights of citizenship would have included the right to a fair trial, the right to appeal a ruling to the emperor directly. Both of those come into play, by the way, in Paul's uh, missionary journeys because he is taken to trial, and he does indeed appeal to the emperor, and that's how he ends up in Rome. And also, he would have been afforded exemption from any kind of degrading penalties, which in that time would have meant scourging and crucifixion. Now, of course, those are two things that Jesus Christ had to endure because he was not a Roman citizen. And so, again, his punishment was the most humiliating punishment and death that the Romans would give an an offender or someone who had been arrested. So although he was a Roman citizen, Paul would have been educated according to Jewish tradition. And we know that he studied under a rabbi named Gamaliel, who was well respected. And actually, it's interesting because Paul was, you know, a persecutor of Christians in his early, early days, just after Jesus ascended into heaven. Uh, But Gamaliel, from what I've read, was a little uh, more temperate, uh, a little more accepting of it, and less, you know, engaged in the direct persecution. So Paul seems to have even broke with his rabbi with that regard. Uh, Later in life, at some point, uh, he acquired Roman literary knowledge and a sense of rhetoric. And this will be evident and important in some of his writings, his use of 
rhetoric, which was their style of argumentation. So as I said, Paul uh, was a persecutor of the early church. Before he became a Jesus follower, he uh, really sought to destroy the church because he was so zealous for Judaism, for the law, and for the traditions of Israel. So he, the Bible says he forcibly removed men and women from their homes and took them to prison, and that he stood by and approved of the stoning of the martyr Stephen. But as we read in Acts, this did not, not last long because Paul was uh, encountered by Jesus. So he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. Um, up until that point, he had denied that Jesus was the Messiah. But upon his encounter with the risen Christ, Paul realized that his zealous devotion to the law had actually led him farther away from God. It's an ironic realization. He was trying so hard to be a good Jewish man, and it led him away, farther away from God, farther down a path of sinfulness because he rejected God in the flesh. So after this encounter, he accepted that Jesus' act of redemption on the cross made it possible for Paul to be set right with God and enjoy a genuine faith relationship. And in addition, Paul understood that Jesus had purified him so that he, along with other believers, had now become vessels for the Spirit of God. Now remember, as a good Jewish man, he would have understood the significance of this, that no longer is God's essence located in the temple building where Paul needs to go to pray. Now Paul carries around the Spirit of God within him because he has been rendered pure and holy by Jesus. So now he comes to be called an apostle. So let's talk about that title, because the title apostle is given to the original 12 disciples, minus Judas, of course, and then plus Matthias. So remember, after Judas's uh, terrible transgression against Jesus, and he killed, he um, kills himself, then they add Matthias to their number. So he is also given that title, Apostle. But we're going to see Paul use it to describe other people too. He uses it for himself, for Barnabas, for James, who was Jesus' brother, uh, for a man named Adronicus, and Junia, yay, a woman. He says that she is uh, a great apostle. So uh, much more to say about Paul and women later. I'm going to have a whole lecture on it for you, but just note that for now, uh, that he does refer to her as an apostle. So some scholars have suggested, and I think this is accurate, that the title apostle would have referred to someone who had seen the risen Lord and was called and commissioned by him to be a witness and a messenger. So lots of people could be disciples, and certainly there are, and they do great things for Jesus and for the early church. But an apostle in particular has encountered Jesus, seen him and had him directly call them to be a witness or a messenger. So even in his own day, however, uh, some people didn't recognize Paul's apostolic authority. And you will notice in his letters that he uh, will sometimes allude to this or respond directly to such accusations. And the reason why is because no one was with Paul on the road to Damascus. Uh, no one was there to encounter or to see and hear Jesus speaking to him. I think there were witnesses, but they couldn't hear or see. So uh, it was just Paul and Jesus at that moment. But this has been true. We've seen this in the Bible as well. Think of Moses. No one was there except for maybe some sheep when uh, God called to Moses through the burning bush. So this isn't surprising or anything unique to Paul but it does uh, render some argumentation against him, and it makes Paul have to sometimes confront this. Uh, but of course, in response, Paul says, look at the fruit of my ministry and of what I'm doing on God's behalf. Would I be able to do this if I hadn't been called by God? And certainly the witness of time bears this out. Look at the churches he planted, the people that he won to, uh, to follow Jesus Christ, and of course, the enduring letters that we have that teach us so much about faith. So we remember from Acts, this pivotal moment, uh, the conference at Jerusalem. 
And this is the big meeting of the, the early leadership of the church to try to figure out what to do with Gentile converts. Uh, so this happened after Paul and Barnabas visited the church in Antioch uh, for the first time. They then returned to Jerusalem because they had collected money for the mother church. And they, Paul is all over this. This often shows up in his letters as well where he is trying to raise money for the mother church because he really saw it as, you know, the, the root of faith that had made it possible for him to go out in mission. And so during, at this conference, the thrill, three pillars of the Jerusalem church meet. So it's James, who was Jesus' brother. We will read his letter later. Uh, Peter, who also has letters, and John, who also has letters. So we'll read their letters later. Uh, but they uh, they held a conference to settle some matters and to come up with rules for the Gentile converts. And at this time, they also talked to Paul, and they kind of formally appoint him as a missionary to the Gentiles. And then James, Peter, and John say, we're going to focus on evangelizing the Jews and staying in the region of Jerusalem, whereas Paul's going to go out into the rest of the Roman realm. Uh, and then also they reinforce his charge to continue to raise money for the Jerusalem church, which you will see he is very faithful to do. So as for Paul's mission field, he sort of has a few main bases of operation where he kind of spends a little bit longer time than in other places. Um, and this is coming from the book of Acts. So the first location is Macedonia and Achaia. Uh, here's he's accompanied by Timothy and Silas as well as Luke because remember in Acts this is written in the first person this section remember this was not Paul's goal he had the vision of the Macedonian man he wanted to go in a different direction and God said no and sent him into Macedonia and his time there was very fruitful it's going to end up resulting in some of his most faithful churches uh, churches that really stand, stand firm on the word of God. So uh, despite this, however, Paul felt defeated, even depressed, if you will, because it's not where he intended to go. And he was met with a lot of opposition while he was there. He didn't stay there as long as he did in like Corinth or Ephesus because he was kind of driven out of town. Uh, people didn't like what he had to say and um, sent him on his way. And so his next big base of operation is Corinth. And it's here that he meets Priscilla and Aquila, who become lifelong friends and important leaders in the early church. And he spends about 18 months there building up the Corinthian church, and then later sends them some letters, which... Uh, will give us much to talk about when we get to those. And then his next big base of operation is Ephesus. He spent about three years there. Uh, he mentored Epaphras, who then himself planted churches in Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. Uh, many believe that it was while in Ephesus, Paul began to understand that he would not be alive to see the return of Christ. So this was a common thought they really thought Jesus would come back before they died, a natural death. They thought his return was imminent. He was just going away for a little bit, and then he was going to be right back to, um, to usher in the end times. And as they start to realize that maybe that's not the case, we'll note in Paul's letters that there seems to be a change in his tone and attitude. He becomes a little more relaxed. Also, this could be because of getting older, uh, becoming more wise in his missionary efforts, having seen and encountered more people. You know, as we get older, uh, sometimes we really do get wiser and we, we start to understand what it means to just love. And so it could be that, and it could also be his kind of understanding, again, that he was probably going to not live to see the return of Christ. Um, also, a contributing factor could have been his ailment. So he talks about it as a thorn in his flesh. Um, he's sick a lot, if you notice in his letters. He'll, he'll talk about being ill, or if he's not sick, half the time he's in prison. Um, so certainly, again, he's got a little bit of a softening to him 
as his letters, uh, as he gets older and um, his letters get older. So then Paul has his journey to Rome. And this is, you know, the epitome of where he wants to be. It is the center of the Roman Empire. Before he heads there, Paul revisits the churches in Macedonia and Achaia, uh, where Titus can, helps him raise even more money for Jerusalem. And he makes a fatal mistake. He goes back to Jerusalem to bring these contributions, and there he is arrested. He's sent to Caesarea by the sea and to stand trial before Felix. And it takes two years, which is funny because he's supposed to have a right to a speedy trial. So I don't know if this is just relative or what. He does eventually exercise that right. And then he also exercises his, his right to appeal because uh, Felix denies and you know keeps him in prison. And so he's sent to Rome to plead his case before the emperor. And in Rome, it's estimated that he spent another two years or so under house arrest. We don't know the outcome of his appeal because the book of Acts ends just before he does this. Uh, but some ex, you know, extra biblical writings, writings that exist outside of the Bible, uh, by the historian Clement, suggest that Paul was acquitted and that he went on to preach in Rome and possibly Spain as well. At some point, he was arrested again and tried in Rome again. This is mentioned in 2 Timothy. And at that trial, he is found guilty. And uh, church tradition states that he was beheaded with a sword at the third milestone on Ostian Way and buried there, uh, where now sits the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. Uh, most likely, he was beheaded at the hands of Emperor Nero around 65 AD. Coincidentally, this would have been the time that Mark might have begun to piece together his gospel. So that kind of makes sense in terms of time. If you think of Mark's gospel, remember the urgency with which he wrote um, kind of inelegantly and just getting the facts out there, it would make sense. If Paul died, you can imagine what that would have done to so many of these churches he was just such a revered leader in the church. And so in response to that, in response to the persecution of Nero, Mark wrote his first gospel. It makes it, it tracks, as we would say. So let's talk about the letters of Paul. So we know that Paul was inspired to create a model of church growth that it's amazing that 2,000 years later we still practice. He planted churches and then he allowed those churches to expand and mature via their own self-governance. And this is what the missionary effort continues to try to do in the Christian church if they're doing it well, is to plant communities that can then govern and lead themselves. The missionary not intending to stay forever with a community, but to get a community started and then to move on to the next. And he did so with the assistance of an appointed aide. Um, it varies who these people are. Timothy's one of them, Titus, uh, Silas, we'll see him mentioned, and others. Paul often, as I noted, didn't spend more than a couple of years, sometimes even less, at each location. So his me main method of correspondence with these churches he had planted was letter writing. So when issues or needs arose within his churches or even within churches planted by some of the people he mentored, Paul would write them letters. Thus, all of Paul's letters could be described as situational. What I mean by that is he wrote these letters for a specific group of people in a specific time and place with a specific reason. And so we have to keep that in mind when we analyze. However, his letters often were circulated as well. One house church would send it to the next house church and on and on for instructional purposes. And Paul was aware of that too. So as we analyze and interpret his letters, and not just his, but any of the New, New Testament letters, we have to really do our best effort to understand the situational context because it is important. It doesn't mean that there is not instructional value. There is, and Paul knew that. But some of what he says is meant for a specific 
time and place. And so we have to take care not to pull his sayings out of context because things can go real bad. And it's why I believe uh, a lot of people have sort of a negative opinion about Paul or at the least kind of wonder about him. Uh, who was he really? Uh, some of his thoughts seem to be at odds with what we know of Jesus. And there's just, in general, typically confusion. But that's because, again, we have to do our due diligence to carefully extricate from the letters what we can still use today and what things are really meant for a specific time and place. That's true of all the Bible, by the way, isn't it? I mean, that's what I've been talking about all along. Being careful with context, not to take things out of context without really having a good understanding of the original intent of whatever we're reading. So let's look at the chronological order of the events and letters of Paul. Now, a huge asterisk here. This is debated. I will talk a little bit, and when we get to each individual letter, sometimes I will bring up if there's like a huge controversy over its dating or even its authorship. Uh, but for this purpose, I'm going with this order. It's not, you know, perfect. There's dispute about this, but it's what I'm going with, and I like it. And um, so we're going with it for our, our uh, analysis of Paul. And I will be looking at his letters in this order rather than in the order that they are in the Bible because I think it helps to see how Paul changes, how his argument develops, what issues the church is dealing with at the beginning of his letter writing campaign and kind of what those become towards the end of his missionary years. So Paul was born somewhere around 3 AD, um, so he is a contemporary of Jesus. He was converted around 35 AD, and then the Council of Jerusalem happens between 49 and 50. Then at the same time comes his letter to the Galatians and his letters to the Thessalonians. Some people swap those, um, so but we're going to look at Galatians first, but they, they're really, really close to each other, the Galatians and the two Thessalonian letters. Um, then between 53 and 57, we have his letters to the Corinthians and the Romans. Uh, then 60 to 62 AD brings us letters to the Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. This is incidentally during Paul's imprisonment. And then 62 to 67 AD brings us to Paul's final letters, which are to Titus and two letters to Timothy. And then he's executed somewhere around 65 to 67 AD. So Paul envisioned his churches to be as becoming extensions of his ministry. Uh, but that's really the, the only thing that connects them. There's not a huge ecclesiastical authority in this day. There's not like, um, yes, they had the Jerusalem Council, but there's not kind of like an overarching governing body. There's the mother church in Jerusalem and then there's Paul. Uh, and so there's really a kind of Paul, Pauline umbrella over the churches, but that's it. Um, each church also has its own kind of flavor and grapples with different issues. Uh, so within each of his churches, he preferred to choose spiritual leaders or mentors who were gifted by the Holy Spirit. And he would often encourage the churches to continue to identify its leadership by that. Like who has the spirit? Nurture that. Um, look to the spirit. That's how you should be choosing the people to govern you. The churches, as I said, often had common elements because they're under Paul. So they've, they're going to come across with a Pauline theology because that's who planted them. Uh, but he also doesn't in, attempt to make them all conform exactly perfectly to one another. There's a lot of freedom in worship in the early church. If a church seemed to be straying too far out of line, um, Paul would admonish them, but he never disowned an entire church. Uh, he permitted sharing meals and fellowship with non-Christians, and the only thing he considered off-limits was idolatry and sexual immorality. So uh, this comes courtesy of one of my seminary professors, and it's helpful as we look at the letters of Paul. Uh, 
he presented us with five factors for really understanding him. And the first is that he was a Jewish man. He considered himself to be a faithful Jewish man to the end of his life. He was just a Jewish person following after Jesus Christ. Uh, that was the intention, by the way. Christ, you know, the Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus, were supposed to be a continuation. They are a continuation. We are a continuation of what be, God began with the nation of Israel. But instead, it turns into two, two forks because there are so many Jewish people who indeed reject Jesus Christ. But Paul was not that, but he still retains a lot of his Jewishness. He served as an apostle to the Gentiles, uh, but that is due in part to his Jewish background. He, along with other Jews, anticipated a restored Israel. Uh, the end times, the, the picture of what that kingdom of God will look like is typically described as some sort of version of Israel restored. Uh, he wanted Gentiles to understand the foundation of, that God had laid with the nation of Israel and the Jews. It's all plan A. And Paul wanted the people to know that. So he still refers to the Old Testament. He talks about uh, things from his Jewish faith in order to have a good foundation for the Gentile believers who are kind of coming in cold without a lot of knowledge of any of this. Uh, another factor, number two, to understand is that Paul has an apocalyptic eschatology. Eschatology, just a fancy word for view of the end times. And this was something that started to arise in Judaism. And we saw that in our study of the Old Testament, looking at like the book of Daniel, for instance, we saw a lot of apocalyptic uh, visions happening in that book. So Jewish apocaly apocalyptic eschatology, boy, that's a mouthful, and identified two ages. The present evil age in which humankind is ruled by sin and the age to come in which God will restore all of creation and there will be no more sin. Um, and so Paul will use this terminology over and over again. He'll talk about the present evil age and he'll talk about the age to come. You can think of it as God's kingdom if too, if you want, you know, the, the not now and not yetness of God's kingdom. So Paul adds to Jewish understanding of eschatology uh, with a Christian perspective, of course. God has intervened in the world via the cross, the resurrection, and the enthronement of Jesus Christ. And so Christians live in the overlap of the two ages. The overlap because evil has taken a decisive blow. Jesus has come, and so he has dealt the, the the final wound to Satan, if you will. But uh, Satan hasn't died yet. <laughs> He's still flipping around, uh, waiting for the, the death to come. And so uh, we await Jesus' second coming when evil and Satan will be vanquished once and for all. He will be thrown into a lake of fire, never to be seen or heard from again. So we're in that in-between. Believers are called to live in this in-between. And we are Expressly, Paul will say, are to put off the old age and put on the new age. So we are to reject the present evil age and live into the hope of the age to come. That's where we are in the messy overlap of those two realities. Uh, so within this framework, Paul offers his theology. Um, so sometimes this means Paul will express discontinuity with the past. So he will talk about the Mosaic Covenant having been fulfilled and that it no longer defines the covenant people of God. You're going to see this right off the bat in the first letter we look at, which is Galatians. He's going to say the Mosaic Covenant was unable to deliver people from sin and therefore believers in Christ need not submit to it any longer. But Paul also expresses continuity because the new covenant is based in the knowledge, perspective, and revelation of God's plan that Jesus brought to us. So it is all plan A. So there's continuity, and yet some of it has been stopped because of Jesus. 
particularly having to follow the sacrificial system, the priestly system of the Old Testament, and the Mosaic law. So according to Paul, we now know that God's covenant plans have been worked out. The mystery of Jesus Christ has been revealed. And so we see a direct line between God's actions in the past, present, and future of creation. So again, discontinuity and continuity. It's a a fuzzy line, which we'll look at in, as we study the letters. Number three to understand is Paul and his relationship with Jesus. Paul talks about Jesus in light of the entirety of Jesus in breaking into the world, his incarnation, his birth into a human body, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his enthronement. Sometimes we get focused on maybe just one aspect of that. Or sometimes uh, people really focus on the cross and what Jesus did there. And of course, that's amazing and wonderful. But all of his in breaking into the world is important. And Paul will touch on all of those aspects in his theology. So to understand Paul, we have to realize he gives equal weight to each of these parts of Jesus, to the fact that he took on human flesh, to the fact that he... Uh, went about um, in this missionary effort in, in the final years of his life to, of course, his death on the cross and then his ascension into heaven, his victory over death, and the fact that he now sits at the right hand of God as Lord over every aspect of our lives. So he points to believers as those who are, quote, in Christ. That is important language to be in Christ. Um, He'll say God has done something through Jesus that allows us to stand in relationship with God in the hands of Christ and lordship and oversight of the faithful are given to Christ. So we are rendered holy. We are rendered pure. We are, our sins are forgiven. We're given entrance into the kingdom of God. We get to be co-inheritors of this kingdom with Jesus Christ because as believers, we are in Christ. So therefore, it's Christ that makes it possible for us to be seen as holy and pure and and able to enter the kingdom. It's not us. It's not anything that we have done for ourselves. It is being in Christ, or as John would say, abiding in Christ, remaining in Christ, following the feet of Christ. This is important to Paul. It's important to his theology, and really it's important to us for understanding what it means to be a believer of Jesus Christ. Number four, uh, for understanding Paul, we need to understand Paul and his understanding of God's purpose. So he is going to link our calling as believers to God's purpose, teaching us, of course, what God did through Jesus, and then what we as believers are to do next. So we continue to carry forth the mission that began, really, (laughs) in the Old Testament came to its full fruition in Jesus Christ, and then we carry that effort forward. We are now the hands and feet and voices of Jesus. And finally, we have to understand Paul's calling. Um, His call was to found and shape the communities of the kingdom of God into communities that really understood what it meant to live into the age to come. And so we're not just... (laughs) made holy and and abiding in Christ, and then, oh, we can go do whatever we want because we're in Christ. Uh, No, there are responsibilities that come with living into that age to come. There's a call to holy living that make the age to come more manifest. And so that is our job. We don't get to do whatever we want. We do have to be focused on holy living, made possible by the Holy Spirit. Um, this is different, however, than the Mosaic Law of the Old Testament. And again, we'll, we'll look at that as we study each letter. And then finally, let's talk a little bit about ancient rhetoric because it shows up in Paul and it helps to understand a little bit of, of you know, the foundation of it. So ancient rhetoric was a manner of speaking. They used it in debates. They used it in court hearings or in like formal teaching, any kind of public setting. And it was highly valued in Roman Uh, Greco-Roman society. Um, The elite were trained in rhetoric. It was a core component of the highest level of education. And the reason was people wanted to learn how to speak persuasively to an audience. And so there's three main types of rhetoric. Uh, 
forensic, deliberative, and epidictic or demonstrative. So the first is forensic or sometimes called judicial. And in this, the people listening are acting as judges of some past action. So the person speaking is using rhetoric to try to convince them of something that has happened in the past. Typically, this would take place in a law or court setting, and the goal was to accuse or defend past actions. The second type, deliberative, the listeners would judge what should be done in the future. So in this instance, the speaker is trying to convince them or dissuade them from a future course of action. Typically, this took place in a political arena, for instance. Think of that in our times as well, like political debates. They're trying to persuade people's voting choice in the future. Then the third type of rhetoric is epidictic or demonstrative. And in this type of rhetoric, the listeners are spectators. Um, they're hearing discourse about present conditions. So the speaker here is wanting to typically educate, uh, to praise or blame something happening. So this typically would have taken place in a lecture hall. So you can think of, of like what I do um, as uh, epidictic or demonstrative rhetoric. So regardless of the type of rhetoric, there were four components. Uh, an exordium, which was the introduction, narratio, which was stating the essential facts of the case, probatio is then offering main arguments or proofs, and then pararatio was summarizing the main points in order to make an emotional appeal. You will see this loosely in Paul's letters, uh, so kind of think of it as you're reading them. So the question is, how much do we apply rhetoric as an interpretive clue for Paul? Um, not as much as some people want to do, but we don't disregard it altogether, is the short answer. So some things to consider. Remember, for the most part, Paul's letters were heard rather than read. Most people couldn't read, and so the letters would have been delivered by someone that could read and interpret the letter for the listeners. Uh, ancient education was involved in learning how to write letters, but rhetorical training was really only for the elite, and Paul wasn't probably at that level of society. He probably picked up rhetoric from listening to others teach and speak and just kind of noting the way that they laid out an argument. So the conclusion is rhetoric does seem to have influenced Paul, and you'll see it, I think, as you look at the letters, you can kind of see intro, facts of the case, arguments, summary, model. Um, and so we want to bear it in mind, but it's not the only way to study the letter. Some scholars get really into it and everything has to be analyzed according to rhetoric. And I don't think that that's true either with Paul. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind and where it really factors in, I will point it out to you. So Paul and the language of faith. So in the Protestant tradition in particular, um, faith can take on a somewhat passive connotation uh, where, you know, the Protestant Reformation became sola scriptura. And of course, Martin Luther was, was just all about its grace and nothing that we do. And so sometimes it can come across that Protestant tradition is opposed to any kind of activity or doing. Uh, here's a comment by someone from the Protestant tradition. He wrote, faith and doing are opposites. Doing furnished what is legally and rightly demanded. Faith receives what is gratuitously bestowed. And there's truth to that, but uh, in Paul's language, faith has a more activeness to it. It's reminiscent of the Old Testament covenant relationship. Remember, Israel entered into a covenant with God and they agreed to live a certain way by being loyal to the one true God and loyal to his ways. And so this is how Paul's going to talk about faith as an active relational concept. So it's not faith as in here's a checklist of things you have to do in order to become part of the kingdom of God. It's not that, but it's not doing nothing either. Faith is an active following of Jesus Christ. It is following his feet. It is picking up our cross. It is nailing our lives to that cross. And it is pursuing holiness. So uh, faith blends into obedience. 
So we don't just need correct understanding of Jesus. We need to see the world in a whole new light. We need to be following Jesus. And then if the Holy Spirit, we do, the Holy Spirit is in our heart, we are going to be transformed and we are going to look different. And so it's a doing that comes about by faith. Because of our faith, then we are equipped to, to live a holy life. And so um, a correct understanding would be to say faith isn't about having the right data or software. It is about using the right operating system. It should change your entire worldview, if you will. All right, so that brings us to the end of Paul. So kind of keep these things in mind as we're reading and studying his letters. Uh, the next episode is going to just be a brief one, looking at letters themselves and kind of a pattern that we might identify. And then we're going to launch into Paul's letters in chronological order, not biblical order. So we're starting with Galatians. So I will see you for the next episode on the New Testament letters.